Hey, hi everybody. Welcome to uh, the uh, Stormwater Awareness Week's uh, session uh, entitled Common Mistakes and Misconceptions Associated with Compost-Based BMPs, Best Management pra Practice Applications. And my name is uh, Dr. Craig Kalaji. I'm uh, the Business Development and Sustainability Manager for San Pasqual Valley Soils, uh, located in Escondido, California, here in San Diego, beautiful San Diego. And as such, I am a, uh, that soils program is a, a composting facility, as well as associated with the Frank Conine Dairy. We are the only composting facility associated with a dairy in the San Diego region. We make a number of products, including the only organically OMRI certified palm manure based compost. And so um, we have a lot of uh, recycled organic material coming in, coming in and being processed and going out every single day. Uh, somewhere around 2000 tons a month are processed and produced uh, in, into uh, some form of compost being utilized either as a mulch or as a soil amendment. So what we're gonna be doing today is I'm gonna be covering a number of topics. Uh, I will start with, I'll give you a quick overview. I'll start with the reason why it's important we start to understand how to utilize compost, what some of the mistakes are, and more importantly, what some of the misconceptions are about how to use this material and what it, what it is used for. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get started. Okay. Can everybody see my screen? I hope Yes, so. we can see it. Good, beautiful. Thanks for confirming, Rebecca. All right. Uh, I'd like to start off by talking about a recent, relatively recent, it's actually going on five years old, Senate Bill 1383. A lot of people are unaware of this bill that's gonna create a new reality for how and where we use recycled organics. It was passed into law in 2016 and the effect, it will become effective statewide in less than six months, January 1st, 2022. And let me, let me share with you why it's important that you understand what this bill is and how it's gonna change the lives of every Californian. Uh, landfills currently are the third largest source of methane in California. Organic waste in landfills, when it's buried and used as average daily cover, which it used to be, it's no longer, emits about 20% of the state's methane. It's a climate super polluter, 84 times more potent than carbon dioxide in holding in heat in our environment and atmosphere. Organics like food scraps, yard trimmings, paper and cardboard make up half of what Californians are currently dumping into our landfills. Reducing short-lived climate super pollutants like methane and other organic waste will have, the, uh, uh, produced by other organic waste will have the fastest impact on climate in minimizing and reducing the effect of climate on our environment. So what is this new law that goes into effect in this coming January mandate? Well, in September of 2016, Governor Jerry Brown set the methane emission reduction targets for California. It was called the LARA Act, Senate Bill 1383, in, in a statewide effort to reduce emissions of these short-lived climate pollutants, or what some people like to term as greenhouse gases. The targets must reduce organic waste disposal 50% by actually last year, and we did not hit those numbers. So now we're into phase two, which is 75% reduction by 2025. And this bill is designed to do that through a mandated compliance requirement that affects every municipality and city in the state. There was also a component where rescue for people to eat at least 20% of the currently disposed surplus food uh, is in place by 2025, meaning there is an effort to collect food waste and from that recover 20% of what we're throwing away to feed the hungry and the needy populations within California. Beginning on January, 
of this coming year, it will require cities and counties to procure, to actually obtain, purchase annually a quantity of recovered organic waste products. It'll be based on the population of the different cities. So each city will have a different procurement requirement, but these requirements will strengthen California's green self-sustaining economy. And you're gonna see a lot of new industries popping up surrounding the, this particular mandate. CalRecycle, the regulatory enforcement for solid waste in California uh, for the state will assign an annual procurement target to each jurisdiction based on its population. And the jurisdictions can fulfill their target by procuring any combination of the following recovered organic waste products. Compost, mulch, which can be compost or uncomposted recycled organic material, renewable energy, and uh, that will uh, be produced through anaerobic digestion at various facilities and will also produce electricity from this material. Let's see if I can. Um, Rebecca, how do I minimize the toolbar on the bottom? Do I just click on the screen? Will that go away? I think so, yes. Uh, is it still there? And it's blocking some of what I'm trying to show. That's why I was trying to minimize it. Or if you move your mouse off the screen, it should go away. Okay, let's hope it does. All right, thank you. All right, how much more compost are we actually talking about here? Well, to reach that 2025 goal of 75% diversion, California would need to produce an additional 5.5 million tons of soil enhancing compost per year annually over the 1.8 million tons produced, for example, in 2017. So we're around, around 2 million right now. An additional, we will double that. So there will be a, roughly a threefold increase of compost that needs to be diverted and applied somewhere to deliver beneficial services. Some of the uses for compost, both mulch and growing media are, are described in this slide here. Compost and mulch provide many direct and indirect benefits when used in landscaping and as a component of systems and treatments designed for. The storing of carbon in the soil, carb, what we call carbon sequestration. And then soil water retention fine compost, and we're gonna talk about the importance of particle size when, it, when we talk about compost. A fine half inch minus compost will absorb and hold, one cubic foot will hold four gallons of water. That's the ability of this material to act like a sponge and retain water in the soil, allowing it to infiltrate rather than escape, run off and flow into the ocean or someplace where we cannot access it. Erosion control, huge, huge tool that we're gonna be talking about and I'll be showing you slides on that application. Fire remediation, uh, comp it has been shown by University of Nevada and UC Cooperative Extension that composted mulch is the least combustible landscape mulch you can apply around your home for, for reducing the risk of wildfire, for embers coming and igniting your landscape and spreading into your home. Stormwater management, not only is erosion control, which is the uh, prevention of the detachment of the soil particles from the surface of soil, but stormwater management is how we filter that water, how we can treat that water to improve its quality. Agriculture and rangelands, its use uh, on agriculture and rangelands for the sequestration of carbon and for enhancement of the forage is uh, been taking place up in north of San Francisco as part of the Marine Carbon Project, a fascinating project. If you have time, please Google that. And then I'm having a little trouble. Like I said, I can't get rid of my toolbar to see what's underneath my toolbar. So um, I'm not sure. Rebecca, how I get, how it I get. says other uses at the bottom. Oh, it does. Um, okay. Oh, there try. I, I, do you I, have I, the I, view I, button up on the top, right? I of the screen. I did have it up there when it comes up again. I'll, uh, you can change the view and that might change the size of your PowerPoint. So you can see it okay, better. Very good. Thank you. So let's go to the next one. Okay. Oops. 
Composted mulch and growing media, the number one mistake that we're going to start with regarding the appropriate use of compost for managing stormwater is not knowing the difference between a composted filter media, what oftentimes Caltrans will refer to as coarse compost, a one to three inch minus particle size, and a composted growing media, what again Caltrans would refer to as a fine compost, a half inch minus material, three eighth inch, half inch. What you typically think of as compost is the fine growing media. All compost is not created equal and particle size is critical and key to how we use it and how we uh, manage it. So let's take a look at these different tools. The one on the left is the coarse, three inch minus, two to three inch minus, what we call filter media. It's designed to uh, provide optimum filtration and hydraulic flow. And we use it for capturing sediment and filtering out contaminants. Keep in mind, all of these uses for compost are essentially mimicking the way nature works in preserving and protecting our environment. So that's your coarse material. It is a compost. A lot of people say, well, it's also a mulch. Yes, they are absolutely right. But the fine material on the right, the grow media or the erosion control media, is also can be used as a mulch as we'll see later on in my presentation. And this is designed for optimum water absorption and plant growth. So let's look at this particle size and particularly as it relates to the filtering of stormwater and the removing of contaminants from that stormwater. If you look at this slide and you focus on the center circle, that is your optimum zone of performance, if you will, for capturing the most sediment and still allowing the stormwater to flow easily through this coarse material. And as you can see, the coarse of the material, the less, less performance you get in terms of removal of sediment, but the finer the uh, mulch, the greater the filtration, but the much lower filtration ability. So you're trying to really balance the two. And so it's real important in the, all the specifications for composted filter media falls right into that main area in that yellow circle. Now, when you look at the US EPA's compost blanket specifications, particle size distribution, you'll notice 100% will fall through a three inch screen, another 100% all will fall through a one inch and even a three quarter inch. So a compost blanket, because we want it to absorb that rainfall and break that energy as that raindrop hits the surface to prevent dislodgement of the soil particle, we find that the majority of the material compost that we use for a stormwater blanket for erosion control is gonna be in that quarter inch, half inch range. Three quarter inch uh, can be 65 to 100%, about zero to 75% in the quarter inch. So right there in that half inch, three quarter inch range is an ideal particle size for erosion control. And let's go back to looking at the coarse material and how we would use it in a containment system like a filter sock, a mesh material that you can place the coarse compost inside that tubular mesh and that will contain the filter media and prevent it from being blown out due to a concentrated flow of water. And so it makes it very easy to place a, if you will, a coarse compost berm into the flow of water and filter it. And let's now look at what the performance of that would look like. In a compost sock, for example, uh, you can see it from this slide that the removal efficiency is 77%. And the sediment exposure you can see is the same for all three treatments. The gallons per square foot 
of runoff that's been exposed is identical and the size of the treatment area is identical. Silt fence, when it's installed correctly, it hasn't blown over due to a storm event, will be about 72% as a blocking device. And then straw wattles about 59%. This is very consistent with results across the United States as it relates to the filtering capability to remove sediment from stormwater. Now, if we compare an eight inch compost filter sock that has the correct particle size, keep in mind that that two to three inch majority, about 60% of it's gonna be in the two to three inch range, and then a 12 inch diameter filter sock, and then one where we have a 12 inch compost tube, similar to a sock, but where the particle size is too fine. Now let's take a look at what the results are in terms of its ability to perform and remove sediment and why these details and these kinds of mistakes can cost you a lot of performance. So the compost filter sock, eight inch diameter, basically overtopped at 28 minutes. The Compost filter sock at 12 inch because it's a larger diameter overtopped at 55 minutes. The off spec compost sock at 12 inches overtopped at 26 minutes. And the sediment loss is directly proportional to how well that particular device filtered that water. So if you look at the very far right, removal of efficiency for an eight inch sock was 82%. 97% for the compost filter sock, that's 12 inches in diameter. And for the 12 inch sock or tube that had the fine media in it, it was 66%. Well, what does that look like when you start looking at the actual material uh, that was filtered and the amount of sediment that was removed? Well, if you look at the eight inch compost filter sock, it performed actually better than a 12 inch compost tube that had too fine of filter media in it. Again, emphasizing the importance of particle size for performance. The eight inch compost filter sock generated 43% less tons of sediment than the 12 inch compost uh, filter sock uh, or the 12 inch off spec compost tube. And the 12 inch compost filter sock generated 91% less sediment than the 12 inch off spec compost sock. That's the amount of material that would have been lost if the particle size was too small. Overtopping therefore, overall sediment performance is influenced by this filter media particle size of the compost filter sock. And the increased overtopping means a lower design capacity, reduced slope length and or drainage area allowance, therefore requiring uh, an increase in cost and a increase in the loss of sediment. So here's an example of different recycled organics used in stormwater management. On the left is a, uh, that coarse composted filter sock that meets spec. The one in the next to it is a wood chip. It can be, when we cannot get composted overs or wood chips, alternate filter media can be simply wood chips that are the correct particle size and that will remove mechanically a, a equivalent amount of sediment. What it doesn't do that a compost filter media does is it doesn't biologically start to degrade some of the contaminants trapped in the sock like hydrocarbons and other contaminants. The next one where it says the filter media that's composted, it has some biological activity. You can add natural absorbents to that media and that will increase its ability to pull out other contaminants like E. coli bacteria, what have you. That's a specialized use for industrial, oftentimes applications or areas where you know you have, let's say a high level of phosphate in the runoff. You can add things to the composted media and actually filter that material out using that material. The one on the right, green infrastructure. That is the Growing media can also be used as a mulch and we'll, we'll explain why in the production of stormwater blankets, but that is your fine compost versus the coarse. Another thing that's really important 
to avoid making mistakes when using compost best management practices is the kind of mesh that you use. There are many different types of mesh. Filtrex International pioneered the use of meshes for containing filter media and growing media, both the coarse and the fine. And the polyethylene is lower cost. The polypropylene, you can get a, a, a coarse weed or a finer weed, depending on what material you're putting in there. And, and all of it will uh, dictate the cost of the mesh. The, the tighter weed will cost a little more. And then we have these natural wood fiber meshes now uh, that are becoming more and more important as people want more biodegradability in their stormwater management tools. But we're gonna talk about that now because it's really important when we move towards biodegradable mesh that we understand it's designed to decompose on site, meaning after it's been installed. The rate at which a biodegradable material will begin to decompose and fall apart is directly dependent on the amount of moisture and the warmth present and must be installed very quickly, typically within one week, following the production and delivery to the site to avoid possible loss of the integrity and ability, the integrity of the mesh and the ability of that filter sock to, uh, uh, to be installed and to perform. And we're gonna show you some pictures of what I mean. So here's a wood fiber pallet just produced. And then we're gonna wrap it with plastic so it can be transported to the site and wait two weeks and unwrap it. And here's what it looks like after two weeks. And you'll notice early signs of biodegradation. You may think, well, that's not a problem. Okay, it's just a few little holes. The material seems to be staying put. But let's see what happens as we unwrap this particular uh, BMP, this particular product from the pallet. That mesh ruptures upon removal from the pallet, thereby spilling out your filter media and making the um, compost filter sock unusable in making it impossible to actually install it. So you have to follow the instructions. Typically the companies that make the biodegradable filter sock mesh require you to sign a statement that you will get that material down within a week after receiving it in order to maintain its integrity. In addition, after a material has been laid down in the field, let's say it's a, you've done it, you got it, you got it down, no problems. It held together, it's in place. After two years in the field, this is what that mesh will look like. You'll oftentimes see the top of it still intact. Depends on how much rain. Remember I said moisture and heat are the key, but you'll notice the entire bottom of the sock has decomposed over this period. And so in this particular uh, example, we went ahead and we, we held it down so the wind wouldn't blow the mesh off and we evaluated for another two years. And even after four years, there were still some traces of this biodegradable mesh. The point being is when you put down a biodegradable mesh, it doesn't mean it's just going to disappear magically after two years, three years, four years. You will still see the process of nature decomposing that organic material that encompassed the uh, growing, uh, growing or filter media, in this case, the filter media present on the site. So a lot of times people are very surprised and they go, well, why didn't it disappear? It's because all the environmental conditions weren't optimum to decompose the very top in a dry, arid environment like California. So if this stays wet, it will decompose a lot faster. Everything I said is dependent upon the moisture and the temperature and the exposure to the microbes in the compost on, on the surface of that mesh. Another thing that problem people have is the underfilling or flattening of compost socks. Underfilling is when you fill it with a blower truck, typically if it's palletized, it comes at the diameter size that you ordered, eight inch, 12 inch, what have you. Underfilling happens more often when you're using a blower truck tube to fill the sock on site and drop it in place. Also driving over compost socks that have been installed, both will reduce the effective height of the filtering device, reducing or eliminating its capacity to filter runoff before it overtops. Here's an example of a, a compost filter sock. It was 
It was a polypropylene sock that had been driven over so many times, it was literally as flat as a pancake. And to give you an idea, this is that same sock compared to a eight inch sock that's been filled to specifications. So you can see we've lost a tremendous amount of our capacity to actually filter the runoff through the filter media within the sock. And you can only imagine that the flattened sock that has been driven over will uh, easily top over with a very low flow of water where the other one will stay intact and the water will go through the filter media rather than over the top. Here is an underfilled biodegradable sock. And you can see it's supposed to, this is supposed to be 12 inches in diameter. And those stakes are probably four or five inches. So this thing is maybe two to three inches. It was horribly underfilled and therefore its capacity to even act as a slope interruption device has been compromised because of underfilling. The addition to, in addition to underfilling it, in this particular case, they also put the wrong filter media in it. They put a growing media in it. Now, I'm gonna talk about the fact that growing media can be a good thing in a sock, but in this particular case, that was not what they wanted to use the sock for. This sock was to be used as a slope interruption device. And in this case, putting a fine growing media compost in the sock definitely impacted its ability to filter. We saw what happened in an off-spec filter sock with fine media. The same thing's gonna happen here. We lost a tremendous amount of the performance of this particular BMP as a slope interruption device and as in its ability to filter stormwater. So here it is installed on a slope prior to a rainfall. This was back in July or August, back in August in September, we got a, a couple rainfalls here in San Diego. Uh, this was a Caltrans project. And this is what it looked like after the rainfall hit it and the landscapers came on the site and actually walked on the sock that had already started to decompose with that very active growing media in it. The socks literally ruptured, were torn. Here's some more examples of it. Truthfully, it's a perfect storm, so to speak. So um, I highly suggest that you not do this. This is a serious problem of not following the specs for a compost filter sock used as a slope interruption device for sediment and erosion control. So, oops, there we go. So compost and green infrastructure, um, naturally a blanket of the fine material however, can be blown as a mulch and not just a soil amendment on the surface of, of uh, soil that's bare, it's been disturbed, has no vegetation growing on it, and it will naturally filter and absorb that stormwater runoff and provide a stable and fertile environment for plant growth. So here's an example of a blanket that's been applied with seed in the background and in the foreground without seed both vegetated and non-vegetated. In both cases, it is doing everything it was designed to do, which is holding the soil particles in place and preventing soil erosion. It also is supporting soil health development of the underlying soil. And again, this would be your fine compost. Here's an example again with seed and uh, compost. equals soil health equals plant health. I'm going to get it just one sec. For some reason it's not advancing. I'm not sure why. There we go. Nope. Huh. There we go. So compost blankets, fine material. In this case, we used a fine material about 80% and we added a little coarse material about 20% to hold it on this slope 
and we blew it with native seeds in it. This is 400 feet in height. Each of those terraces is 100 feet in length. I know you can't see it, but there's a little tiny man up there on a harness being held on the slope, blowing a half inch minus with native seed on a rock quarry. This is a rock quarry in San Diego that had been mined for decades. And so all the topsoil, you're, you're literally asking something to grow on subsoil with no topsoil present. This is that same slope, two years post insulation, where you see some of the native seed germinating. They did irrigate it because we were in the middle of a drought. So they irrigated up the native seed. And this is it four years post installation. You can see that even in extreme environments, if you add some organic matter and feed the microbiology in the soil and improve that soil health and provide moisture and the appropriate seeds, in this case, native seeds to the area, you can actually vegetate even something as extreme as a rock quarry. And you can see in the foreground, just the kind of soil that we were asking these plants to grow in. Here's an example of placing the fine compost into a sock. In this case, we're using a polypropylene sock because we, we don't wanna use a biodegradable sock mesh in a situation that's gonna be exposed to heavy forces and stress from running water during a storm event. In, in short, along the banks of the stream bank. So this bank had severely eroded. They filled the socks with a growing media and put some seed, grass seed, in with the compost, the fine compost. Now, I, I wanna emphasize that they only, all these examples I'm gonna show you of compost in socks are only using straight 100% half inch minus, three eighths inch minus compost. They're not adding any other amendments to it. It's just compost straight, blown into the socks and installed on these banks. Here it is after a, a few, few uh, days. And the term they use for this is called soft armory. Once that root system engages underneath that sock, it anchors that sock into place and eventually, okay, it's hanging up on me a little bit here. There we go. Eventually, it completely, this is 20 days after installation. Eventually, it completely fully vegetates. And there it is, 18 months. And what that polypropylene mesh will do is it'll act like a turf reinforcement netting, holding that organic matter and that root system in place, thereby armoring the edges of that bank, but still providing you all the environmental benefits of a natural system. And so it's an extremely effective tool when used correctly. The misconception or perception, if you will, that compost only can be used as a soil amendment. I think this is a great example of showing you that's just simply not the case. Here's another example of using 100% composted media for vegetating the socks and in addition, adding some willow jammed in between the layers of compost growth, vegetated growth socks to stabilize a very steep wall along the river creek. You can see in this case, they're uh, also improving the stability of the, of the site with large boulders and riprap. And this is what it looks like after everything's vegetated. Again, another excellent example of using compost to soft armor, very extreme environments and provide all the benefits that come with carbon sequestration, water absorption, habitat for wildlife, heat island reduction, and of course, stormwater prevention and, and management. So I'm going to now review the, some of the common mistakes we just talked about associated with compost BMPs. And then I'll, I'll open it for discussion. Number one, particle size dictates the application and use. And we looked at the different particle sizes. We looked at its impact on performance and use. Number two, application and budget determine the mesh. When, when should we be using biodegradable mesh? 
when we know we're never going to have to move it again and it's not going to be exposed to landscapers walking on top of it or heavy concentrated flows of stormwater because we know that it's already going to be decomposing on the bottom and a heavy concentrated flow of stormwater will move that biodegradable mesh. In that case, you'd want to use a polypropylene mesh under an extreme uh, storm event to keep that composted filter media or growing media in place. Budget also can determine which mesh, mesh you, uh, you supply or you decide to utilize. Different quality meshes will cost different prices based on the longevity of the material and what you want to use it for. I would, particularly under extreme uh, environments like stream bank restoration, you use the tighter mesh with more fibers per square inch, stronger as the more resistance, it can handle a lot more stress from the flowing water than a looser weaved mesh, or certainly you would not want to use a biodegradable mesh in a stream bank restoration type application. Biodegradable mesh, as we saw, requires special care and management, both in getting it to the site, getting it off the pallets if you're palletizing it, or if you're blowing it in place, making sure that you understand the nature of biodegradability and how variable it is based on moisture and temperature and the location of where you're placing it. Coarse compost filter socks are used for sediment control and for filtering of stormwater. It is still a compost. You can also use wood chips. They will do a good job on sediment, not as good a job in removing other contaminants like hydrocarbons, nutrients, bacteria, and other contaminants like heavy metals. Five, fine compost for vegetated socks allows you to create soft armoring in extreme stormwater uh, environments where you're getting a lot of stress on that surface you can place the material in there. It will allow the vegetation to vegetate and germinate through the sock, thereby stabilizing it, allowing you to create green infrastructure and soft armoring extreme areas for optimum erosion and sediment control. And then lastly, a fine compost for compost erosion control blankets as a compost mulch. Typically a one to two inch layer is all you need. You can add seed to it and vegetate it as we've seen, and it will do a marvelous, the best job for erosion control is simply a vegetated soil. And that composted half inch minus material at one to two inch layer will act as a sponge to absorb the water, support the development of the germinating seeds and stabilize that soil underneath. It will also, add a tremendous amount of nutrients to the biology of that soil, uh, enhancing the long-term sustainability of the vegetation that you have planted. So that, that's what I wanted to cover today. And I wanna leave you with just one closing comment by a favorite writer of mine, Mark Twain. And he said years ago, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And I really believe that applies so much to our understanding and use of compost. And with Senate Bill 1383 just around the corner, I think it behooves everybody to take another, a, a new look at compost as a tool in your toolbox and as something that needs to be understood and needs to be learned in order to maximize the uh, maximize the performance of the material and minimize any future mistakes. So with that, I'm going to open it up to questions. There's my contact information. If you'd like more information on these, uh, these topics or any other applications that we talked about today, I'd be more than glad to respond to either your email or you can call me. So with that, Rebecca, I'd like to open it up to any, anybody that would be interested in, uh, asking any questions on what they see. Awesome. If you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. But we do have a question from Aaron. Um, he asks, where are good resources to get proper installation instructions? Uh, there are some excellent resources, um, truthfully, on the 
Filtrix website. Filtrix is F-I-L-T-R-E-X-X dot com. They actually have a very, very robust website with a, a digital design manual outlining the uses of compost, 24 different applications, and, and a whole slew of technical specification sheets on how to best optimize the use of compost and how to, how to get the best performance for the right application that you're trying to address. So that's one place. Um, the Cal Recycle Compost Use Toolbox is also another excellent resource that I would highly recommend folks look into. And then uh, the US Composting Council publishes a number of books, booklets, I should say. One is called The Soil and Water Connection, A Watershed Manager's Guide to Organics. These are very inexpensive. I think they're like $10 each. Uh, they're available through the Composting Council Research and Education Foundation. And they also have another one, The Compost and Climate Connection, A Land Manager's Guide to Organics. Both publications are loaded with reference material and research uh, citations on where to get more information on how to utilize compost effectively for what you're trying to do. Uh, the, the Filtrex website, um, they charge nothing for that information. However, if you're a municipality and you need a non-commercial, if you will, uh, non-proprietary source for the information, Forrester Press out of Santa Barbara has published a manual called the Sustainable Site Design Manual for compost uh, low impact development. So if you go to Forrester Press and just Google the sustainable site manual, uh, that is all of these applications that Filtrix has published, but without any commercial connection or, or reference to it. And so that is a publication that you can purchase. And uh, for, for municipalities, I carry it around when you know someone just wants a non-proprietary source for the information, you can utilize that. But truthfully, uh, Filtrix is the pioneer. They've done more work in this area than any company that I'm aware of uh, and are, is a great place to start. Awesome, any other questions? Well, it looks like that's it for today. Thank you so much, Craig, for sharing this workshop. It was awesome. Um, any final thoughts? I just encourage people to uh, really understand the importance of recycled organics, a uh, carbon, if you will, and its role in the management of this environment of ours and how important it is for us to educate ourselves on the carbon cycle and the management of carbon in our environment. All living organisms are absolutely dependent upon carbon. We focus a lot of attention on water management, on air quality, but we oftentimes don't spend near enough time on how we manage the carbon in our environment. It has become a critical existential uh, issue within our lifetime. And I highly encourage you to take advantage of these resources that are available out there and, and become really a, a advocate and a promoter of compost-based BMPs as a way to address some serious environmental problems. I think some ways you can almost look at compost as the Swiss army knife of environmental tools in your toolbox, meaning it can do so many things for you when you understand how to use it and where to use it. Awesome. Well, I would like to add one other thing. One of the biggest challenges to the use of compost is logistics. And I highly encourage you to look into the use of, comp, uh, of blower trucks. Uh, and there are also now blower units that carry like five cubic yards that you can tow behind a pickup truck for the application of compost blankets and the filling of compost socks. I don't believe compost will truly, truly realize its potential until we work out the logistics of transporting it to where it needs to be used and applying it effectively and cost effectively and blower trucks and blower units, little 
little blower units that you could hook to the back of a pickup truck are gonna be instrumental in the adoption of compost BMPs because without it, it becomes very laborious, a manual labor task that most people aren't gonna be prepared to do. So yeah. I, do, I do caution you on that, that use the technology that technologies that's available. There are blower truck companies out there that you can hire to help with your applications, or you can even now I, I hear you can rent some of these smaller units, tag them on the back of a little small pickup truck and do your blowing using that in the conveyor belt system to feed the hopper of the small unit to apply your materials. Perfect. Well, we are about out of time. And yes, there was a question if this is recorded. It is being recorded and it will be available on our website, which is stormwaterawareness.org, probably within the next 24 hours. So you can watch it there or you can share with your friends. And thank you everyone for attending the Stormwater Awareness Week workshop. We have one more day tomorrow that has a bunch of awesome classes. So be sure to go check back on our website and see what's scheduled for tomorrow. But thank you everyone. And we hope you have an awesome afternoon. Thank you, Rebecca, for all your help. All right, talk to you guys later. Take care. Thank you.